This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We gather today as the ministers of the Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church to present to you on this Good Friday, the seven last sayings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is our privilege to minister, minister to you in this way. Mm -hmm. So I am proud that these ministers have volunteered to come to you today as we move toward Resurrection Sunday uh, to present to you these seven last sayings. So sit back and enjoy them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. My name is Reverend June Pierce. I'm one of the associate ministers at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church, and I'm coming to you with the seven sayings of Christ, starting at number one, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is coming from Luke 23 and 34. The key word here is being for, forgive. God incarnate or God in flesh is teaching us that one of the keys of suffering is forgiveness. Jesus teaches us that even in the midst of a crisis, the midst of persecution, you and I must forgive. We all have been taught forgiveness isn't just for the offender, it's for you. Forgiveness text comes from the Greek word aphiomi, meaning to permit, allow, not to hinder, to depart from one and leave him to himself so that all mutual claims are abandoned. My favorite one is to leave so that what is left may remain. What I'm saying to you is that the king of glory, suffering on that cursed tree, looks at his creation and says, I'm going to abandon what you have done so that the only thing left is my work at the cross. In other words, I forgive you because I cannot let this interfere with the work of the cross. This should teach me and you to let nothing stand in the way of suffering. Don't let what people are saying about this pandemic get in the way of what Christ has come to do in your life and the life you now live in Jesus Christ. Don't let social injustices, conspiracy theories, cause you to have seeds of hatred towards a certain group of people. Don't allow church hurt to paralyze you from being all you can be in the church. The word in the Greek, aphiomi, is the same word that's heavily used throughout the New Testament. That lets us know that Jesus was very intentional about what he said. It appears over 170 times. However, in John, it's used when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. It's also used when Jesus told them to loose Lazarus from his grave clothes. It was used when he encouraged the disciples that he would not leave them comfortless. And also in Mark where he says he has the power to forgive sin and on and on. In Hebrews 12, one and two, wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us or slow us down. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the, the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Forgiveness to some may seem like suffering, but remember, it frees you to get onto the joy that is set before you. Like Christ who endured the cross, despising the shame. Unforgiveness is a weight that, and a sin that trips us up. Jesus didn't wait until he rose again to forgive. He did it after being flocked, beaten, scourged all night long, wrongfully judged, set to die a criminal's death on a cursed tree, a makeshift crown of thorns pushed into his head, hemorrhaging from blood loss, six inch spikes nailing him to a tree with thorns and thistles to die as a condemned man between two thieves. While the weight of this body is crushing his lungs and his diaphragm, he musters up enough breath and says, forgive them. He loosed them and us from our sin. Forgive someone today. Forgive yourself today not just because the scripture says forgive and you will be forgiven, but because 
he had they known what Jesus would accomplish on the cross, they wouldn't have done it. So says 1 Corinthians 2 and 8. It says, if they knew what they were doing when they did whatever they did to you, if they knew you would survive and do great exploits because of it, they wouldn't have done it. Someone ought to shout today that God don't deal with us as we deserve. Forgive them for they know not what they do meaning abandon the mutual feelings of offense. Christ has come to set you free, free from you and free from them. It has been nailed to the cross and left in the tomb. Leave it and live your best life. Forgive, amen. Praise God. I'm Ken Foster and I'm one of the associate ministers at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. And the saying that I will be talking today is, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is found in Luke chapter 23, verses 43. Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. You know who our Christ was speaking to at that moment? He was speaking to one of the thieves on either side of him on the cross. Our, cross was, our Christ was in the midst of being crucified because of what we like to call today fake news. Fake news about it was producing jealousy and envy and hatred and, and, and cruel lies being spread about our Savior. And he's on this cross just because of that, simply doing the job that God had sent him to do. Pilate had already declared our Savior innocent of all charges, but it didn't matter. They still wanted him crucified. So our Christ finds himself on this cross suffering undeservedly so. And on the other side of him are two men who absolutely are deserving of the punishment that they are currently receiving. Thus, this is where our tale begins. One of those criminals who was hanging on the cross had the nerve to hurl insults at our Savior. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now, it wasn't just enough for the religious leaders or the soldiers to mock our Christ, but this criminal saw an opportunity to jump in with the crowd and continue on with all the lies and the false narratives. This criminal on the cross, in his own misery, suffering, weight on the nails on his hands and at his feet, had to take time out to mock and ridicule Jesus. He saw this as an opportunity, not as a time to get right, but as a time to stand on somebody else's misfortune. Now, don't we see that in today's world today? People enjoying stepping on the sorrows of other people, taking secret joys because they're not the ones suffering. Well, this is what that criminal, he took his opportunity to do just that. He was deserving of the punishment that he was receiving because of his actions. And in, even in the midst of that punishment, could still take time out to dole out more punishment to someone else. Now we get to the crux of the matter. There's another thief now. Don't forget about the other one on the other side of the on the on the other side of our Christ. And this criminal heard the other fool on the other side, and he knew that they were both deserving of punishment. So he turned to the other criminal and rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, what a wonderful sign and faith this repentant sinner had in Jesus. Far more than a doubting Thomas, one of Jesus' own apostles, ignoring his own suffering, Jesus now responded to this criminal, living out his own beatitude of blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy, and said, truly today you will be with me in paradise. Let's think about this now. This is the ultimate definition of God's agape love for all of us. He loves us so much and so hard, it, it's just incomprehensible to us. It's unfathomable, it's unsearchable, not being, but this God is willing to receive us and welcome us in, in spite of who he knows we are. It's not just that we know who we are, God knows who we are and still he accepts us. All we gotta do is acknowledge who he is, repent and turn away. This God received the criminal because the criminal accepted responsibility for who he was and then recognized who Christ was. Mm -hmm. Ain't that amazing? Mm -hmm. It might seem unfair. You can have somebody who's done crimes all their life, murdered, 
done all kinds of horrible things. But get this. Our God is so loving, so powerful, so mighty, so majestic, so, so all-encompassing all that if that person who's done all those terrible things turns to our Christ, confesses his sins, acknowledges that Christ is the son of God, and asks for forgiveness, he gets it. He gets the opportunity to be an attorney with the rest of us. All of you longtime church folk, been there, baptized, saved, Holy Ghost, fired, baptized, filled, knowing you know the Lord, second best, yes. That criminal can be right there with you celebrating and shouting and hollering hallelujah because I've made it. And that's all because of not anything we've done or he did, but what God has done. That love that just don't make no sense to common humankind. Sin does not actually prevent us from entering into paradise. It's the receiving and accepting Christ that's the essential criteria. Believing and confessing brings eternal life. That is, in fact, the reason that Christ endured the cross, to eradicate the consequences of sin, the power of sin, and even the presence of sin. We see here the truth that although we are instructed to believe and baptize, again, the agape love of God is in operation. This, this dude didn't have a chance to be baptized. He just accepted, acknowledged, and received. And God is, just understand something now, God is not a God of technicalities. I know Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church, we believe in our operations manuals, we believe in our policy procedures and bylaws. I get it, and I'm not saying there's not a place for it, but I'm telling you, God's love supersedes all of that, and it will continue to supersede all that for as long as we exist on this here planet called Earth. Because God understands one thing. He understands who we are. Get it? He made us, so he knows our heart and our minds. So this second word is all about forgiveness, and this time it's directed to the sinner. Just as the first word was also about forgiveness. This word is about forgiveness. It's a, this, and this biblical expression is found only in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus shows his divinity by opening up heaven for a repentant sinner. Such generosity to a man that only asked to be remembered. Remember me, Lord. This expression offers us hope for salvation. For if we turn our hearts and prayers to him and accept his forgiveness, we will also be with Jesus Christ at the end of our lives. So let's repeat here. The thief understood and confessed. The thief believed that Jesus was, the, was not only perfect and innocent, but Jesus was the Messiah incarnate. And then the thief believed that Jesus was the only way by which he could enter God's kingdom. The thief believed that this salvation is by God's grace, and Christ responded to this thief's faith by promising the thief that he will enter into paradise. The thief knew that he could not enter heaven on the basis of his own merits, but that he was a criminal, so therefore he needed to go in on someone else's merits. Those merits are done by Jesus Christ himself and Jesus alone. So I say to you today, if you are struggling, you have found yourself outside of the will of God. Call out to him and say, remember me, Lord. Remember me. Amen. Praise God, everyone. My name is Pat Sampson, and I'm a member of the ministerial team of Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. The third word. Woman, behold thy son. Behold thy mother, John 19, verses 26 and 27. On the surface of this third word seems to be focused on Jesus while dying on the cross. He's making provision for his mother to be cared for after his death. This indeed does demonstrate his great love, care, and compassion for his mother Mary. The assumption is that Joseph, her husband, was dead. Neither his brothers nor sisters were present. The only disciple near the cross while Jesus was dying is presumed to be the one Jesus especially loved, John. This does not mean that Jesus did not love deeply the other disciples. In the third word, Jesus says to Mother Mary, woman, behold your son, and tells the disciple, behold your mother. Could it be that this commissioning is equally about Mary and the Apostle John? who is acknowledged as the author of the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. 
Let's explore together a little background about each of them. Mary, when she was a young Jewish virgin, was chosen by God to bear the Savior of the world. Listen to what the angel said to her as recorded in Luke 1, 27 through 45. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The angel Gabriel provided details about the son she was to bear. Everything from his earthly name to the fact that he would be called both the son of the Most High and the Son of God. Mary's response, as recorded in Luke 138, was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Later in that same chapter is Mary's song. It is a beautiful hymn of surrender, praise, and worship. Please, when you have an opportunity, read it and keep it in mind as you reflect on her standing near the cross as her son was dying. Let's turn our attention to John, the disciple that Jesus loved. He may have originally been a disciple of John the Baptist. Later, after hearing John the Baptist refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, this John began following Jesus. John, like most of the disciples, was a fisherman. He also was one of the three favorite companions of Jesus. You know, Peter, James, and John. It is in the Gospel of John that Jesus is identified as the Word of God. That is, his existence in God from eternity is clearly revealed. Everything that was made from the beginning flows from the Word of God. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, pinned for us the reality of the pre-existing Word who became flesh as an expression of God's love for the world that whosoever believes upon Jesus Christ as the Son of God shall be saved. The other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are equally important and share the good news of Jesus Christ from different perspectives. Amen? Amen. Should we put Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, and John the Apostle, and the writer of the Gospel by the same name, in a combined or united theme, what we would discover is God's redemptive plan revealed again and again. John 1, 1 through 5 states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, Nothing was made that has been made. In him, the word, who is Jesus Christ, was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Could it be, looking back, that in the third word of Jesus, there also may be an intersection between God's use of Mary as a human vehicle through whom the light of the world came and the truth penned by John stated in 316, which we all most know by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world 
to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. At this moment in history, on Calvary's cross, Jesus is in the process of completing the, the divine mission for which he came. He came to shed his blood. He came to die. Near the cross, among others, are both his mother and the disciple he loved. Each is carrying within a measure of divine revelation that reminds them of the length and breadth our sovereign God will go to provide an opportunity for whosoever will believe in Jesus Christ. When Jesus said to Mary, woman, behold thy son, and to John, behold thy mother, he was indeed demonstrating great love and compassion for them both. Jesus had been beaten, whipped, and nailed to a cruel cross. And yet, in the midst of all of that, he commissioned John to care for and provide for his mother. He also instructed his mother to view John as her son. What manner of love is that? That manner of love Jesus demonstrated was and is not limited to Mother Mary and John the Apostle. What Jesus Christ accomplished through his life, his death, and resurrection is for everyone who will accept his precious gift. All of us have sinned and fallen short in our lives. All of us. Sin separates us from God. Turning from our sins and placing faith in Jesus Christ is our bridge to forgiveness and our bridge to right relationship with God. If you have not already done this, Please consider choosing Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior today. Amen. Praise the Lord. My name is Marcia Pitts Phillips, and I am one of the associate ministers at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. And I will be talking with you a little bit about the fourth word, which comes from Matthew 27, 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I read from the New International Version. As I pondered over this scripture and prayed over it, I felt led by God that this was a prayer. And the topic this afternoon is a place of prayer and vulnerability, which is where Jesus was when he was on the cross. And I thought about the week and the times that we are living in. Because it's interesting that this week was defined by authorities as to have been and predicted to be the worst in terms of this COVID-19 or the novel coronavirus. And it's also occurring during what we Christians view as Holy Week, what we live out as Holy Week and honor it as a time of when Jesus was crucified for our sins, which was truly his worst week. So what was predicted to be the worst week for us 
we are honoring in what was the worst week for Jesus, which culminates with today, Good Friday. And as I reflected upon these historical times that we're in, because these are truly historical times, and historical times are anything that is of monumental historical significance and is related to an occurrence that impacts or causes a seismic shift in society. And what's going on with the COVID-19 that has swept the globe, mind you, there's not a continent that it hasn't touched. It has swept the globe. These are historical times. And it will go down in history. And it will be looked upon and studied upon and case studied upon in times to come. And when Jesus was crucified, that was a pivotal time in history and one that is written about outside of the Bible, studied, still studied. His crucifixion on the cross was such of monumental and historical um, proportions that it provides a way for us to be able to have our sins forgiven. So let's take a moment and look at this prayer. The words that Jesus uttered, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, was all, were also uttered by David as reflected in Psalm 22, verse one. David was going through an extremely rough period of time. He was, he was suffering anguish, and he cried out, in, and after being mocked and suffering abuse, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It is not stated anywhere else in the Bible or in other studies that Jesus went on to recite the rest of Psalm 22. He said those first words. And that's why when I looked at this, that I believe that Jesus on the cross, that he was in that place of vulnerability, having been beaten, having been whipped, having stood trial, having been, having bled, having had a crown of thorns placed on his head. You can't get more vulnerable than that. But yet, he showed us in a place of pain and in a place of vulnerability that he could take on our heartache and our pain and show us that when we are in that place, that we can cry out, that we have the freedom, that this special freedom that God, that Jesus gave us while he was on the cross. Now envision, if you will, we've seen the image, but just envision, just visualize for a moment. If you're with Jesus on the cross, having had the nails driven into his hand, once on the cross, the weight of everything comes down to his arms and then is, he's carrying it in his chest, the weight of everything, the, the air, and the, almost to the point of suffocation. And all of the fluids coming down into the chest area, carrying. He carried our sin. He also carries our heartache and our suffering and our pain. And in the midst of all of that, saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in the time when this occurred, as it says in the previous Bible verses, scriptures, just before Matthew, 20, Matthew 27, 46, that darkness had descended at the noon hour. Imagine this world that may, must feel to many of darkness at this time the darkness that was so dark of when Jesus cried out in the ninth hour, my God, my God. Imagine Christ up on the hill at, Gal 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 at Golgotha, looking down among the people. And at that time, who was and just looked out, what, what the crucifixion, on earth was violence, hatred, horrible behaviors, 
a lot of things that were hidden beneath the surface, the blanket was pulled back. Just like with this COVID-19, the blanket has been pulled back on a lot in society. We're finding people who are on the fringes, who don't have health insurance, who are living in poverty. We're find, finding their reports that Blacks are dying at a higher rate from COVID-19 than other populations, people who don't have health insurance. A lot has been pulled back. The blanket has been pulled back and unearthed all of this. However, but juxtaposed in the middle of Christ dying on the cross for our sins, in that place of vulnerability and prayer, that there was also the hope, the hope that we could look to, and that he opened up that way so that when we are in our down and out period, that we know that we can cry out, that we also know that hope would come, that there was a brighter day was going to come as a result of his crucifixion. And I believe that in the midst of all this COVID-19, we're also seeing greater acts of compassion and of kindness and of people providing help to one another. We're seeing families get close together. We're seeing those who are on the front lines who are laboring and providing care and providing services. And we also know that there are those who are laboring around the clock who are working to provide and create a vaccine. And the one thing that we do know that when Christ went to the cross, he didn't take any shortcuts. He had to go through this pain. His pain and his agony came out of him crying out in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, if I will take thy cup, this cup from me. He cried out and he got to that place. It wasn't a shortcut. He knew that he had to go to the cross. We don't want anyone who was working on coming up, working on a vaccine or working and providing care or anything for all of us in this crisis. We don't want any shortcuts. We want the proper services. But we know through this that we can see a season of hope, a hope that was provided by us, by our Christ, our love, our Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, who provided a gateway to eternal life and for each and every single one of us to have our sins forgiven because Christ, he was in that place of prayer and of vulnerability for you and me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Can you hear me? This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice in it. Hi, I'm one of the social ministers at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. My name is Reverend Letitia Johnson Shutrup. And I have the fifth word, and it comes from John 19, 28, and it's, I thirst. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things was accomplished, that the scriptures must be fulfilled, said, I thirst. What was Jesus referring to? What was Jesus trying to communicate? These two words, when Jesus was crying out on the cross to his father, was of Jesus' willingness to fulfill his father's prophecy in the Old Testament. In Psalm 69, 21, Jesus said, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. Jesus was suffering on the cross for our sins. Jesus was in control, God was in control to assure that his prophecy and divine purpose 
would be completed. What lesson can we learn as we go through this pandemic with this COVID-19 where we all have to social distance, stay in our homes indefinitely, we're isolated, separated from our families, our spiritual families, our churches are closed. People are dying, lost of jobs. What does this mean? What does this mean? It means that God is still in control and his time is not our time. We need to depend on God. When Jesus spoke our thirst, he was actually speaking of a physical need for water at that time. Here's another time when Jesus was thirsty, John 4, 7. Jesus was in a town called Samaria, where he met a Samaritan woman. The girl was drawing water at the Jacob's well. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The woman said, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? That was because the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Then Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. The woman looked surprised. And then she asked, where can you get this living water? Jesus answered, anyone, anyone who drink this water from this well that you're drawing from would be thirsty again. But whoever, he said, whoever drink the water I give them will never thirst and have eternal life. Hallelujah. As Jesus was hanging on the cross for our sins, calling out to his father, Jesus was willing to suffer in pain and imagine all the pain that he went through. And he said, I thirst, was to fulfill his father's perfect divine plan of our salvation. He knew of the prophecy. And after that, and all this suffering was over, he was gonna go join his father in heaven and be at the right hand in heaven. Remember that God is in control and his time is not our time. I thirst. At this time in our life, there is a physical need that we need. It's not water. It is the need for our Savior, Jesus Christ, to control our hearts and to come in our life. Hallelujah. This is the Holy Week. I said the Holy Week. And let us expect a miracle. Don't you expect a miracle? I expect a miracle. Hallelujah. Jesus was beaten. He was spit on, pierced in the side, a crown of thorns placed on his head, mimicked the kings of kings and nailed to the cross for you and for me. He was a perfect man. He was born to die. And in this pandemic, Keep praying, y'all. Don't stop praying. Keep fasting. Keep God close in your heart. Have faith. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. I said, wait. God is not by our time. He's on his own time. Wait on the Lord. He is standing at the door of our heart. And if we just knock, he'll come in. And he has sit and he invite us into his world. This is a tragic thing that happened, but it's a wonderful thing that happened because Jesus didn't have to go through that, but he went through that for you and me. There is no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Let's be thirsty for nothing 
for divine purpose of God, divine plan for our salvation. Jesus said, I thirst, represent the willingness to surrender and submit himself to his father for the plans of every mankind. When Jesus was suffering on the cross and he said, I thirst, he did it for you and for me. And I just want to say, thank you, Lord, for doing that thirst. And I'm going to thirst after God every day of my life. And I just want to thank God for the suffering that he went through for me and for you. And I praise God in Jesus' name. And this is Reverend Letitia Shutrup at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. All right. How is everyone doing? My name is Reverend William Pierce. I am also an associate minister at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. I will be exploring the sixth saying of Jesus. The scripture is John 19, 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. It is finished is the sixth saying of Jesus. However, I believe it is one of the most important saying of the seven last sayings of Jesus. Why is that? Well, it is significant. I mean, it is the significance of this saying that makes it so important. If you look in the Bible, if you, if you study this saying, if you look it up in the Greek, it is finished in the translation of the Greek term to tell estai. It is in the perfect indicative mood of the Greek verb to tello, which means to bring to an end or to complete. The mood and tense of a verb indicates the attitude of the speaker, and Jesus' grammar reveals the following. In the perfect tense, the action was completed in the past, which, which results continue in the present. While Jesus finished the work he finished that day, the results are still in effect today. You ought, to, you, ought to, you ought to say hallelujah right there. The work he started back then is still in effect today. See, the indicative move of this verb, the act that took place or condition is an objective fact. The work that Jesus finished was definite and real, is real. Jesus did die and he did rise from the grave on that third day. Many of us can identify and or relate to tasks and having to complete or finish tasks in our lives. Yes, all of our lives, we have been subjected to starting and having to complete one task after another. However, after looking back on these tasks, there are two things that should stand out about tasks we complete as human beings. First, all of our tasks are not meant to be a productive or positive outcome or to have a productive or positive outcome. No, there are some tasks that we have initiated and completed that were not conducive or beneficial for us or anyone else. There's some things we got involved in, some things we started, some tasks that we, we, we were involved in that were not conducive for other people nor ourselves. Secondly, we were not always satisfied with the outcome of the task we were involved in. I don't know about you, but there's some things that I have done the things that I was involved in, that I wasn't satisfied with the outcome. If I could do it all over again, if I can go back and start some of the things that I've done and redo them, oh, I, I would do them different. But thanks be to God, I don't have to go back and God is still in control. However, that is not the case in this particular situation with God in Jesus' word in John 19.30. You see, when Jesus uttered the word, it is finished, he was referring to something that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden, mankind sinned by committing an act that was contrary and disobedient to the will of God. As a result of the act, all mankind is sinful by nature and subjected to the penalty and the consequence of sin, which is complete separation from God. Therefore, there need, needed to be a resolution imposed to bridge that gap created by sin and thereby reconcile mankind back to God. You see, one of the requirements for dealing with sin was the shedding of blood. you find these words in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the New Living Translation. 
In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that some shedding of blood transpired on Easter? Actually transpired on Good Friday. On today, it transpired. Back in the Old Testament, see, a lamb had to be slain for, for, for the Israel had to be forgiven. But we, we, trans we transition over to the New Testament and where we find Jesus. And Jesus is that lamb. But we find these words in John 1, 19. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, this is where Jesus entered the narrative that has been written and directed by God. God devised a plan for salvation for mankind when Jesus, and actually Jesus was that plan. But John 3, 16 states, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It was because of love that caused Jesus to send his only begotten son to the world for the world. Why, you ask? I'm glad you asked the question. But we find these words in John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore, this task of work of salvation began in the garden. However, it was implemented at the birth of Jesus and culminated at the cross. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus constantly and consistently adhered to the will of God. For in John 6, 3, uh, 638, we find these words. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, God, Jesus was trying to do the will of the Father. He said, if there any other way, let this cup pass. But then he said, not my will. He thought about the task. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus uttered these words, it is finished because the suffering he had endured or was enduring was about to end and subsequently meant his reason for coming to earth the work or task that was before him would be completed. Therefore, he was satisfied. How do, how do I know? How do I know he was satisfied? I go over to Isaiah 53, 11. After he has suffered, he will, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquity. Jesus, fulfilling the role of suffering servant, now looking back on his ministry or work, can be satisfied. Thus he can say, being taken from judgment hall to judgment hall was not only worth it, but it's finished. Being lied on and spat on and abandoned was not only worth it, but it's finished. Being misunderstood and speaking ill of was not only worth it, but it's finished. Harry to carry our old rugged cross up a hill called Carry, nails being placed in his hand, rivets being nailed in his feet was not only worth it, but it's finished. Yes, the suffering is finished and therefore I'm satisfied. Jesus can say I'm satisfied because he knew that the Father was satisfied because the work was complete. Moreover, Jesus was not only satisfied that his suffering was finished or completed, but he was satisfied that mankind could now be reconciled back to the Father. Remember, in the beginning, I told you that the perfect tense of the word to tell Esther finish meant that the action was completed in the past with results continuing in the present. Therefore, while Jesus finished the work he finished that day, the results are still in effect today. That should make you shout. That should make you shout today, especially on this day, on Good Friday. And it should make you shout or look forward to shout on Sunday. When Jesus finished that work over 2,000 years ago, that work is still in the work today and still having an impact on us today, which means that salvation is still available to us and for us today. Oh, no, if you don't know him, you can get to know him. If you know him, you can get to know him better. Oh, I, I just wish that I had some people who wanted to, to get to know Jesus just a little better. Yes, Jesus bore and took on our sins that we might give up and be forgiven of our sins. Jesus died that we may live. Jesus conquered death that we might be released from the power of death. Jesus rose from the grave, resurrected from the grave, that we may rise above our situation, any given situation, but also that we may rise with him on that great resurrected day of the return of our Lord and Savior. Yes, it is finished, and this is why we can sing the words of this song. God sent his son 
they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. And if the grave is there to prove my Savior's live, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Or I may have some pain. I may, I may endure some things, but I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Yes, people are dying around us. Yes, my family sometimes I'm worried about. But I, I don't have to worry about the fear, but God got their back. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. It is. It is finished. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Everybody praise the Lord. I'm so honored to be on this uh, team of ministers who came before you today with the seven words of Christ. And didn't our hearts just burn as we heard them talk about the words of Christ and what he has done in our lives. Um, I have the uh, task of coming before you again and closing out in Jesus' final words. And we come to you from Luke 23 and 46. Again, I am Reverend June Pierce. I am one of your associate ministers at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. Here we are. It says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I heard a sermon on the radio from a Roger Whip about um, the last words of a dying man. This preacher said that the most important words a person can say is the ones before they die. He states, the last words of a dying person are normally never forgotten. A person's closing comments are diverse, often revealing their pain, their agony. Some enter into eternity without saying anything, while others utter sentiments that disclose their values, priorities, and their innermost thoughts. He used many examples of well-known people's last words, and I'd like to share a few of those with you today. P.T. Barnum was the famous showman. When he died, he asked, how were the receipts today at Madison Square Garden? Humphrey Bogart's last words were, I should have never switched from scotch to martinis as he lied dying of throat cancer. Joan Crawford was filled with anger when her maid began to pray out loud and said, don't you dare ask God to help me. Leonardo da Vinci, when surveying his life's work, said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Steve Jobs, who's the founder of the Apple Corporation, his final words was, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. And Charlie Chapman, if you're young enough to remember him, he was at his deathbed, and the priest said, may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Charlie Chapman replied, why not? It belongs to him. And finally, according to the Harriet Tubman movie and various sources on the internet, her last, word, her last words were the scripture, I go to prepare a place for you. Again, the last words are normally never forgotten and reveal the most inner thoughts, values, and priorities. It brings us back to Luke 23, 46, Father into thy hands, I commend my spirit, are the last words of Jesus on the cross. All of the wrath of God is poured out on Jesus, on the Christ. All sins, past, present, and future of the whole world. A, uh, a noted um, preacher that I like to listen to, Dr. Johnny James, he said, the maddest God has ever been was on that day where it had been turned from day into darkness. With all of the wrath poured upon him, he musters out another breath and yells out, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I have three points I want to share really quickly. Let's look at the word commend. Commend in the Greek, in this text, has many definitions. Some are, it means the deposit. It also means food placed on a table to place down from oneself or for oneself with anyone. John 16, seven, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. 
unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Let's look at John 12, 24. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He is reminding us of the words he said to his disciples, that he has to die so that the Holy Spirit will come and rest on each of them some 50 days later at Pentecost. It's one of the reasons that he had to die. Number one, to my point, is we can also gather that from that definition that he is talking about the kingdom feast where he will sit with us. Jesuswalk.com put it like this, an expectation of the great feast on the last day. It begins perhaps with a wonderful prophecy from the book of Isaiah. Speaking of the last days, Isaiah 25, six through eight. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and finest of wines. We skip down a little bit where it says, the sovereign Lord will wipe away their tears from all faces and he will remove the disgrace of his people from the earth. You find echoes of this prophecy in the Old Testament and the New, finally being fulfilled in the book of Revelation with the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is Revelation 19, six through nine, and the new heavens and the new earth, Revelations 21, verse four. The scripture also teaches, I, will, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my kingdom. Matthew 26, 29, Mark 14 and 25. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Verse 17, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That's Luke 22, 16 through 18. Number two, his final words say to us in the definition deposit that in his dying, he became sin, buying us back from the sinful state. We being worthy of death, he took our sin, who had no sin, took them upon him and paid the ransom for us. He became what God hates to, to give us access, not only to be saved from the wrath to come, but to also have victory over sin in this life. I have to say that one more time, victory over sin in this life. God's work through Jesus on the cross leaves his Holy Spirit and the feast available to all them that believe. His final words leave us with a promise and a hope for a future. We were a priority, value, and innermost thought as he transitioned. You and I were on his mind and how we will show the glory of his work in the world forever. Take advantage of this promise and this gift you must receive him. John 1 and 12 said in the New Living Translation, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. In his dying, paying for us includes taking part in his death. Romans 6, three through six, which is um, in God's world translation. Don't you know that we all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. When we were baptized into his death, we were placed into the tomb with him. As Christ was brought back from, the, from death to life by the glorious power of the Father, so we too should live a new kind of life. If we have become united with him in death like this, certainly we will also be united with him when he comes back to life as he did. Verse six says, we know that the person we used to be was crucified with him to put an end to sin in our bodies. Because of this, we are no longer slaves to sin. My third point, the final definition about what Christ states to place down is from oneself or for oneself with anyone. 
is to receive the comforter. Acts 2, 1 through 4. This scripture tells us who, what, when, where, and how in four, four verses. But it also says how to do it. How to do it didn't come until after Jesus was, uh, or he sent his comforter into a bunch of believers at Pentecost. Everyone else in Mark 28, 19 told you what to do. Mark 16 and 15 said why to do it. Luke 24 and 47 says where to do it. And John 3 and 3 said who to do it. But how to do it came as Peter preached on that day of Pentecost. It came in Acts 2 and it answered all the questions. Now, when we talk about the spirit, we talked about command and now we're talking about spirit. The spirit in the Greek is also translated as a quick blast. It's what came suddenly and that's the spirit that he's coming back for. What am I talking about? These last words reveal the thoughts and priorities of Jesus on the cross. His final words explain that the breath of life the breath of truth, the Holy Spirit had gone out of him and returned into heaven. So you and I will have access to the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit to navigate us. That spirit in the Greek is the life spirit, the Holy Spirit. He gave it up on that Friday, dropped it off in Peter's sermon in the book of Acts. He gave that spirit up so that God can pour it out freely. Like he said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Do you have it? Do you want that life-giving spirit, that life-freeing spirit? Do you want more of it? Well, if you do, and when you do, please meet us at Fellowship Mission Every Baptist Church, where we will point you to Calvary and to Calvary's cross. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. I want to thank our ministers for coming to us on this day, uh, this day of solemn uh, remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. Um, when you hear this, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus will be buried. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus will have taken him from the cross, buried him in a grave, and then we will await Sunday morning. Uh, it's difficult, as you heard from some of our ministers, to leave him in the grave today, but he's in the grave, <laughs> uh, and uh, he won't get up until Sunday morning. So I look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning when he shall arise, and the Lord will arise indeed on Sunday morning. So please join us in our worship service on Sunday morning at the Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church where we love the Lord. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, maybe bow our heads. For the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Let us all say amen.